on this episode of the podcast i have with me someone who's revolutionizing the way india reads and writes their app has 1.5 million readers from cities that don't necessarily have bookstores the guest is chiki sarkar founder and publisher of jagannath books which is india's first digital publishing company uh, what she does remarkably with her company is that she allows amateur writers like probably you in the audience or even myself to get published and have their names right next to the greats of literature in our country and abroad um and and she's really tapped into the way um indians have been using mobile phones to make everyone a mobile reader which is nothing short of a bloody miracle um this episode in general is is such a curious conversation that i was just taking mental notes the entire time uh chiki's a wonderful woman and i have to say that this is probably the only masterclass you need when it comes to getting published in india like the only one uh so check it out watch it till the end and if you have any co- questions comments let me know in the comment section or dm me on instagram at vinamra kasana enjoy the episode kasana show i am honored like i said before the podcast to have you on here um you are running a disrupting uh, publishing business that has the attention of all the news publications i keep reading these articles and i saw your ted talk uh jagannath books has about 1.5 million readers now and it's expanding um people must not like the idea that you're breaking their industry right w- what's up with that uh first thing i'm not disruptive i'm not breaking yeah. the industry in fact jagannath has I, uh, so jagannath has two sides to it one is a print side and the other is a digital yeah. side uh i think print uh, as you know i work in a publishing company so i make books the kind of books that you get on amazon or crossword or in your airport bookshops uh and jagna very much makes those print books uh i'm not saying that that print is going to die uh yeah. in fact most of my current revenues in my company come out of my print list it's an incredibly important part of my company but alongside that the simple claim i'm making is uh, you know that uh publishers need to be more ambitious more energetic and more imaginative in the way they think about digital uh publishers so far are, are you know digital just does not make enough money for publishers and then because they have a very complicated relationship with amazon who uh are both in their big you know some of their biggest sellers but also it's a, it's a, you know it's an it can be an aggressive company and uh and publishers are wary of amazon and so so what that has meant is that publishers on the whole tend to think of uh, ebooks as a small component of their business they make ebooks alongside their print books they put it out on kindle and they forget about it and i said uh if you really want to get into any form of digital media you kind of need to own your own platform because what owning your platform allows you to do is it allows you to know about your reader it allows you to talk directly to them it gives you enormous power enormous knowledge and then you can begin to play around with what you give them um and uh you can even think about pricing in a different way subscriptions in a different way so what jagnot has is apart from its print list we have our own app and we've been called the netflix of books in india which is very very flattering we're nowhere even we're like a little ant next to netflix's elephant but uh the the vision is the same which is that we own our own platform to put out really mostly our own content and the kind of things you might read on jagnot is on one hand you might read uh the biography of karunanidhi or savarkar or uh, rana pratap but you'll also read uh, love stories thrillers ghost stories uh short spiritual stuff from uh, sadguru or a dalai lama or an osho uh um, yeah business material so it's it's a kind of cool easy flexible lots of short reads app uh which puts out our print books and then has all of this other stuff and the other cool thing about uh the app which again other apps have done this so we are not pioneering we copied from people who we thought were amazing is we have a writing platform so mm-hmm. if you are an amateur writer and we often feel that writers feel very very distanced from traditional publishers they right? have to get your self noticed how to hard to get your books read by a publisher 
upload your stories and we have editors who read it we do we put them up on home page we sell film rights on your behalf and we've created um a lot of interesting homegrown talent by this amateur platform uh and 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 in fact because it gets all of this on the home page if you're an amateur writer and you've written this story you are on the home page of an app where uh, you're sharing space with the twinkle kanna and arundhati roy and a william dalrymple uh, uh and a saurav ganguly uh, and a rajdeep sardesa you know so you're really you 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 have that chance to 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 have a a, a great stage um and so 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 that's the the business the business is on one side very conventional very traditional and i think those are all excellent businesses i've grown up in those businesses i love them i wouldn't want them to change i just wanted to expand my work and say that listen i do this but i also need to be doing this and this and finding a new way of bringing digital and print in into the same world together so so that's what i do long story short i'm not i haven't i'm not sure i've disrupted anything no i i think <laughs> i think uh, i really enjoyed that monologue because it 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 uh, brings together a lot of the things that i wanted to discuss with you i think what's fascinating is and this is something that you also brought up in your ted talk um is that there is a massive media revolution that's happening in india it's been happening for a while right and uh, people who didn't have technology before have technology right now and with all this access uh, there's inevitability that people get creative and before this i was trying to study the phenomenon of whatsapp writers right how people will write these uh, long form messages everything from you know romantic love letters uh, you know like somehow justifying what a certain policy means ayurvedically that sort of thing the it's 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 not very uh, organized right and and what's funny is with these messages uh, is that uh, the author sort of gets uh, taken out of the equation as the messages get forwarded because everyone is interested in uh, you know sharing the information so what's really interesting is these authors can go to your platform on juggernaut and then get published right and and so they have that recognizability where uh, they yeah, can and their, fact, yeah uh, um you know my uh, my founding ceo durga i raghunath she wants very amazing woman who Mm-hmm. uh set up first post in india so one of the kind of pioneering digital news people and she always told me something she said you know actually the phone and the digital mobile phone revolution in india has actually made us into more bigger readers and bigger writers everyone is writing as you said these whatsapp messages they are reading a lot they may not be reading a book they may not be reading yeah. 200 pages but they are reading short spurts of stuff and it's not all like hi how are you doing and how's the weather it is it is exactly as you said you know did you know that uh, that you know our uh, morning breakfast routine comes from x or y or you know some yeah. ayurvedic some ancient india thing whatever it is so i um i agree and and you know also i do think uh, i don't know whether you ever play this game i mean i do it as a publisher i find that whenever i go out i mean of course the last two months i've gone out not at all but when i but before all those last two months virtually every time i was out someone said to me you know i have, i have a book i yeah. have, i've always wanted to write a book or i'm writing a book or i've written a book and these are not you know these are not people who have english degrees and are journalists or whatever they, they could be businessmen they could be corporate executives they could be trainers uh, they could be cooks you know but everyone they could be architects i mean just the other day man one of my best friends an architect has sent me a short story he's written thought like he would call himself a short story writer or a fiction writer yeah. but somehow that impulse to create seems to exist on with most of, most of us in our own ways uh, and we tr- and creativity remains such a big thing in our lives right like whether it's in our cooking or whether the photographs we take or the way we decorate our home and for many people it's writing stories or telling stories So yeah. yes I mean I do want to say that there are other uh, platforms like what Jagannot did I think what makes Jagannot interesting is that we're that you as an amateur writer are sitting at the bottom of what's called, what I would call a proper traditional publishing house so I often feel like you know there you are you want to write but you want to write and then we jostle next next to your favorite writers whether it's a Chetan Bhagat or a Twinkle Khanna or a you know uh amish tripathi or a durjoy datta whoever it is right or a john grisham or a jeffrey archer for you to say wow you know what 
the same person who looked after these writers are also looking after me and I could access this person in a totally effortless way. And I think I've always thought that that was very compelling in um, for amateur writers that, you know, why does my architect friend want to send me the short story? Because I'm an editor, right? He wants me as an editor to read it. And that recognition, you know, is so important for all artists, right? It's important for someone like you when you make your podcast and you want some formal recognition, right? As, as, as you get more into your series and as you do more and more. And I think this, this, this layering of like being this amateur person who doesn't have access to publishing and then client being, I think what, what Jagannath gives you, it's like a pyramid. And it gives mm-hmm. you the ability to climb up so that you can say, okay, first I put up my story on the site. Then yeah. there may be like one of the editors might like it and pick it for the story of the month. And then it gets put on. And then, you know, they might love it even more. And they say to the app person, listen, we have to give it a banner. So suddenly this unknown person potentially has the access to get full recognition, right? And then what may happen is one of my editors might get in touch with you and say, listen, we love that story. It's done so well. Will you write another one for us? And this time we'll pay your contract and give you money. And you suddenly, it's like a, well, it's like a snakes and ladder without the snakes, I hope. But you've been able to climb up on this board and reach a level of some recognition. And at some point, which we've started is, you know, imagine if you have, uh, you've written three, four, five, six stories on the app. We might come to you and say, listen, let's do a book together, a proper book. And suddenly, there you are. You've got all of it. You've got the digital audience. You've got this world of the app. And then you, you know, you you begin to start saying, okay, I I don't know how much money I'm going to make, but I'm going to make some money. And then I see a book, uh, a book that I can buy in, uh, in, in Crosswords or my local bookshop or Amazon or Flipkart, a book that I can send my granny for her birthday, <laughs> whether or not she reads it. You know, so suddenly that journey and that, that feeling that these worlds are all connected, because really it's about finding talent and giving them the expression of it. That I think is what we do, right? And that's the yeah. that's the thing I'm I, I'm proud of that in its that Jagannath has in its conception, and it's the thing that inspires me and makes me excited about my job and my business. Absolutely, I, th- I think what you guys have done very well is democratize creativity, um, and and made it open without the gatekeepers that come with you know, first of all, being confident in the English language. Second of all, knowing enough people, like you said, right? Third of all, uh, facing numerous rejections from editors and so on and so forth. And so you've enabled like uh, a neighborhood boy with, with a specific sort of, you know, user profile to get, get featured amongst top authors and stuff. Um, what I also find fascinating is, is that uh, this exists not only in just the English language, but also in Hindi, because your website has something very interesting. So first half is in English and the second half is in Hindi. So instantly when, when someone who even comes there on there and discovers that this is a website uh, and feels that, you know, they're a Hindi speaker, they can still uh, find a level of like, attraction to those things because I was talking to my dad yesterday telling him about I'm doing a podcast with you and he showed me this app uh, it's called Pratilipi I believe they're also contemporaries in, in some yeah, capacity to you guys. yeah yeah and and he said oh I've been yeah they're, stories they're, for a while bigger than that. yeah he said he said that I've been reading these stories for a while because these are the stories that I grew up with and it's so fascinating I always he said I love consuming and and I just I just love knowing that the characters are called Dinanath or, you know, it's, it's, it's close to where he grew up with the sort of rustic vernacular idea of India that he was close to and he's able to relate. He's like, he's like no amount of Kushman Singh or a Chetan Bhagat can do that for me, but those stories can. I'm like, that's fascinating. The ability to, to bring reasonality, specific individual experiences right to your phone screen to make you feel like that the whole idea of reading is not, is not reserved to, uh, excuse me, uh, people who have, you know, a solid, English education or even like who are from the upper echelon of society is fascinating. It's the same thing that, that TikTok did, that YouTube did, except now you guys are doing it in the publishing space. That's my little hypothesis. Yeah, and and Lippi, by the way, I mean, it's outstanding. Yeah. They're like 10 times our size. Uh, they primarily focus on Indian languages, so not English. Yeah. Uh, and they've been around for a while and they have an amazing catalog. So, and so what they are is just the writing platform part. The mm-hmm. part where people, you know, so they don't have the publishing component, but it's that demo, dem, democratic, like, you know, you anyone can write stories and they do it in 12 or 10, 15 different languages. It's amazing. 
So how exciting yeah. that your dad reads reads it. And yeah, he I discovered it yesterday. He does he read it on the phone? Your your dad's comfy reading on the phone? Yeah, I I would like to add to your uh, data report in case you're trying to get like more numbers about who reads on the phone. It's it's one more person from my home in Faridabad. He also reads on the phone. So you know, and and it's yeah. weird, right? Because because you would expect the notifications and all the notification bars and everything else to disrupt that. But he's like, no, I read with full concentration. Uh, so so that's that's unprecedented behavior. In fact, I uh, am someone who cannot read on the phone. I still I still uh, I still use the Kindle, but I've just translated to the Kindle. Before that, I was I was a thorough paperback reader, which is something that you also mentioned uh, in your TED talk, right? Uh, you were seeing a world that was changing around you constantly, and and you were seeing a generation that was on their phone, shorter attention spans, more immediacy, quick reactions, that sort of thing. And so you, so you decided to, to bridge the gap. And uh, I have a question, where, where, what was the cheap Bohemian district, as you said in your TED talk, that you set up shop in for Jagannath? Um, it was Shapurjat. Shapurjat. I thought Paharganj first, but then I was like, it has to be Shapurjat. Yeah, it's Shapurjat. And we're negotiating with our landlord at the moment. We have to move out of our very cute little offices. But um, Shapurjat is where, you know, there are all these small outfits and they're creative and also remember, you know, publishing often tends to have young women yeah. in their offices. And uh, so safety is an issue that we have to think about. And so it was very important for us to ha- be in South Delhi, near the metro station, relatively near most girls, working place. If they were working late, they wouldn't have to be- get on a long journey back home. Um, so, and in fact, work from home has changed our attitude even more because uh, the work has been so uh, good and so um, so efficient that we actually think that you know wasting time uh, money on a, on a large office is pointless. It's we yeah. really should be uh, be in a smaller space and uh, and you know meet once or twice a week, rotate staff, uh, have plenty of Zoom calls, uh, and be done with it. I mean, it's just we don't need. I, I, I think a lot of uh, offices are re-examining this, but especially a small office like the arts, we absolutely can move to work from home on a 70% basis, I think, effortlessly. Yeah. The, so it's the, the, big, the, this lockdown's been an absolute shift for us in that way. I hope it's been positive in the sense, well, I, I guess it can be retrospectively positive, I hope, because I've been reading a lot of reports that say that uh, most technology companies, and it's surprising that that is, you know, affecting publishing as well. I didn't expect that. But most technology companies are figuring out that their workers, that their employees are far more productive when they, um, you know, work from home because there's something about being able to manage their own time. Uh, and that's something that several thinkers from the West point out that, you know, as we as we propel ourselves into the future, we'll find that uh, people will sort of work in a gig type economy where they'll pick up work that they like, work in the hours that they like and and do stuff for the rest of the day. Like it's more about self-actualization, reading, changing your mind, that sort of thing. Um, I, I did want to bring up one thing. So you said that more young women work in publishing. Is there a reason for men not not uh, flogging, sorry, flogging I, yeah, the publishing houses? I think, uh, look, I think in India, for example, uh, most middle class homes, it, this may be changing. But at least uh, you may you may well be able to relate to it. Is that the pa- parents will say to the boys, "Listen, you have to do engineering or economics, and you have to have a job that earns good money, right?" Right. Um, and girls says relatively less expectations. So you can do a humanities course, uh, English, history, psychology, whatever, right? Very classic. Yeah. Do it for uh, divided yeah. India. And so, um, so what that means is that if you're that girl who did humanities. Uh, and then you come out, what do you do? You sort of end up with a job in media. And if, if it's not a job in media, you end up with a job in publishing. So that's one. Two is publishing is a really uh, relatively low paid industry and it's a relatively low revenue industry. Uh, we don't, we just don't have enough people in this country who read books. And so as a result, um, I mean, again, this may sound sexist, but there is a way in which, if, you know, the man who wants... I don't know, a certain income or has a certain career ambition Mm -hmm. uh, will not find publishing uh, necessarily an attractive place. While I think for many women, uh, it's a good place. And I hate to say it's because they're less ambitious or they want to earn less. 
but I don't know. I don't know whether it's all a piece of like you did English and history, what you do next. And then, you know, this seems like a lovely job. And you have, it's fair, you know, it's because you're working with manuscripts and you're often editing, uh, unless you're in sales and marketing, it also means that you, it's a quite an easy uh, career to build flex, be flexible about. So it's a good, I mean, you could take, three days off because your kid's sick and you could still manage to do work in a way that a salesperson who yeah. might need to go to a warehouse or do shop store visits or whatever just simply couldn't do right so i think that that work-life balance is naturally in is is built into publishing and so i think it is it has been traditionally and, and traditionally in uh, in really globally been attractive for women i mean the big divide used to be in the west is that Women did editorial, women even didn't do editorial. In the 70s, women were publicists and women in the West. Women were the publicists and they were the secretaries. And clever yeah. men were the publishers. And uh, As is depicted in Mad Men. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you get that. I mean, that existed in publishing really till the 70s, I think. In the 70s, that changed. Uh, and then what you saw that you still see now is that the top management roles are male dominated and yeah. women have the top uh, creative roles. So you can be an editor in chief as a woman, but you are the CEO. And that probably still, I mean, there are, there were a ton of women CEOs of the biggest houses in the West. It, it's just changed in recent years, but you, you, th th that did exist in India, I think very hard to find a woman CEO all mostly yeah. CEOs. so that that divides so you know even with what I mean to say is even within publishing although it's a very woman friendly uh, profession and it's largely dominated by women uh, sales and CEOs, sales in particular and then heading to head of business tend to mostly be men yeah I am uh I'm I'm thinking now about uh, the sort of technology startups that I'm I'm friends with people I'm friends with and there's a there's a massive culture of wanting to be a startup founder here in India in places like Bangalore Mumbai right and even, and even Silicon Valley in the West and uh, most of them happen to be men that's true and then and then I've been to a couple of New York advertising agencies as a student and and then so so it's funny that most creative directors are either a, a team of men and women. And it's also funny that they all wear all black, which is the weirdest thing. I don't know why creatives do that, uh, but they tend to do that all the time. Um, so, so in terms of in terms of the publishing culture, because you have worked at HarperCollins, you headed Penguin, and then now Juggernaut. W w what is the culture like? Because you said it's 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 easy, it's chill, it's it's more about manuscripts, editing. What's what's like an average day look like? Um, so I wasn't at HarperCollins. I, I began my career in a small Random country. house, my bad. Yeah, Random House. Um, yeah. uh, look, most publishing houses are more alike than different. Uh, yeah. Most uh, editors are actually more alike than different. So what would typically happen? Uh, let's say you start the day week on Monday, you tend to probably there would be a meeting to catch up. Uh, there would be an editorial commissioning meeting at some point in that week where editors talk about manuscripts they're reading that they would like to buy or ideas that they have that they would like to buy. So in Jagna, for example, uh, we are very ideas driven. So 99% of the books we buy, we don't get from an, what's called an agent who sells that. So most publishers will wait for an agent submission and then buy a book. Um, Jagnaut ha just makes up our own books. We we just go and we go reach out to people and we and you know and we reach out to kind of all kinds of people. I've just reached out to Karan Johar, for example, yeah, uh, because he was doing a whole lot of Insta stuff on his kids, and I said to him, "Would you like to write a kids book?" And he said, "God, I never thought about it." And then he said, "You know what? This is cool. I want to do it." And we've done it. The book's written, the contract signed, right? So. Uh, we didn't need an agent. We didn't need a go-between. Uh, so, so essentially, one of the interesting things about publishing in India is that, I mean, maybe Jagna does this at an extreme level, but all Indian companies do come up with ideas in their meetings and chase them. And it means that, and, I, and as someone who worked abroad, I would say that is very unusual because in the, in the West, um, everything is much more professionalized and structured. And as a result, there are lots of... Uh, agents and they represent 
all the, you know, if, if I had made the call to the British Karan Johar and said, hi, you know, British Karan Johar, will you write me this kid's book? He'd say, sure, I'd love to. Can you call my agent, please? Yeah. Right. And then, you you know, I'd have to do so. So everything is kind of made into a process and system there. In India, you know, it isn't. India is a place that you can still kind of just across industries, just still, you know, snap a finger and get things done. And so, um, so uh, what that means is that Indian publishers are very enterprising, extremely. I would call us the most entrepreneurial publishing culture, one of the most entrepreneurial publishing cultures in the world, right? Because people are constantly coming up with ideas. They're constantly chasing people. They're constantly pushing people. And most of my biggest hits have come like that. They've come from ideas that we've made in-house. We didn't go to an agent and then we turned it into a hit. From, from starting from even a book like The Accidental Prime Minister, which you yeah. may have heard of. It's a book, uh, one of the last books it's, I did. It's at my place. Time. Okay. It's at your place means? Um, I mean, it's in my home. Home. My my dad oh, bought it. Okay. It was released like a couple okay. of years ago, right? Yeah, it was released in. It was infamous because it happened in 2014, and PM Modi used it at the time for his election. It was a big turning point in his election rhetoric, and many people say that the book was a massive and thing that happened. And you know that book really happened because an editor in the company knew the author, and she'd been talking to him, and then. We, we said, this is the book we need you to write. And then he wrote it. And then we came up with the title. We came up with the cover. We did the, you know, Penguin did all of it. And so, you know, that book, of course, was written by the author Sanjay Baru. And it's his baby. It's his book. But the level of, like, ideation that happened at Penguin from the uh, person who bought the book to how it was formulated right to the end all happened at the company. And so... That kind of enterprising quality is a very strong quality that dominates. I mean, if you talk to any publisher in India today, they will say this. Very, very, very enterprising. Very, very like make calls, get contacts. I know someone who knows someone. Someone knows who knows someone. And they get that phone number, reach out to them. It's, it's really, really amazing. So that is the big thing. And then what happens? So, so the, there are about three or four meetings that dominate the week of any publishing house. There is, a, this, as I say, the commissioning meeting, where, which will be the single most important meeting that editors have. So because they're talking about books they're about to buy, that they want to buy, they come up with ideas, they talk about books that have been sent to them by agents, they talk about pros and cons, sales gets involved. Uh, sales are sales estimates, blah, blah, blah. Very important meeting. The other important meeting is uh, the weekly publicity meeting around the publicity around the book, which is led by the publicity team, but the editor editors do it. And then the third important meeting, which is more invisible, is, you know, when a book gets made, any book, I mean, even on the app, so there are, we call it two kinds of editorial components. So one is you've written a story, right? Mm -hmm. And I read it and I like it. And I say, listen, you know, this is fabulous. But look, you know, this boy, like he, I'm just finding him a little bit like he whines too much. How do we stop him <laughs> from whining? Or whatever. And you say, okay, you know what? That's a good thought. How about I cut this, 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 this. And we have that conversation, right? And once you've done that story, I send it to what's called a copy editor. And a copy editor is the person who dots the I's and crosses the T's and makes the spelling and the grammar all of it right and the punctuations and everything right and that's an incredibly important i mean in a way they're the spinal cord of any publishing house because they they manage the schedule so they'll say acha chiki's meant to send his manuscript today then i'll finish copy editing it then i'll send it to the typesetter then i'll get the jacket then so they're the ones who puts the whole schedule together so um, so that scheduling meeting which allows all our books to come in in a nice, easy flow. There's a timing, all of that. Uh, magazines have this too. That scheduling meeting is also important. So those are kind of the three big meetings. And then, of course, the sales team will have their own meetings. Yeah. Uh, and then there's a, you know, there's a monthly CEO kind of meeting where people are saying, okay, how much money did we make this month? What are our sales like? How are we doing for the yearly bad budget? The kind of thing that would happen in any company, right? Yeah. Uh, so that is... So what would an editor do? They'd come into work, they'd gossip with their colleagues, they'd read a manuscript. Uh, it's a black coffee. They have, 
yeah lots of that uh they would take part in these meetings uh, they would meet authors there would be a lot of author meetings they could meet the author for a meal they could meet the author for a coffee or a drink uh often editors tend to have fairly close relationships with writers the writers would call them for gossip and chats in any you know you know i'll i'll my husband always laughs at me but i'm often on the phone with my authors and it has nothing to do with immediate work it might be this it might be that they might send me pieces i might send them pieces so there's that lots of really there's a lot of relationship and personal back to for back and forth with writers and then there is the manuscript itself once you get it and then you need to be very quiet with it um and edit it and that takes a week 10 days uh for an average indian editor we are often we have far, we do more books than uh, our western counterparts because we just need to do more books to make that money yeah so then you sort of stay still you do that editing sometimes at home you do some of that editing at in your office depending on who you are and that's it then you go to your jacket meeting where someone says oh where's your jacket for this book and oh i hate the, you know sales says what is this rubbish jacket you have created for this writer and then the designer will throw a fit and then you send that jacket to the author author throws a fit then you have to manage the designer's ego and the author's ego and blah 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 so you know there's there's all of that the, the author really is the person who connects the writer i mean the public the editor is the person who connects the author to all the other things that make going into play. whether it's the cover whether it's the publicity whether it's the sales uh whether it's the editing you know they they're the point person on it so so that's what a publisher's life is like in a for a traditional company and even for a company like ours that remains the case as long as you're making stuff with people you will do you know which is that you are looking at people's writing and trying to make it better or trying to take it out into the world or trying to make it popular you will have some you will have conversations like the ones i'm describing and have mm-hmm. work like whether it might be that this person does the work on the computer or on paper it might be a person does the work work from home rather than from office uh but but roughly these conversations and these these interactions will happen yeah i think i think writers are in a very specific place when it comes to sharing their work with editors because i worked as a copy editor myself when i was in college for a fashion magazine and it's like it's like you're you're giving you're giving your baby to someone else with a scissor and saying please please be gentle with it right and and people that you obviously know about this more than i do all writers would have different temperaments about how um, how much they want you to cut how liberal they want you to be with the editing and so on and so forth and some 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 will fight for everything and and some won't right that sort of thing so w- the sense that i'm getting from uh, the whole process of publishing that you described is so your role essentially is is to lead the company forward but then to also put out fires constantly right and 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 sort of become the decision maker in all of these uh, these things right how, how what's what's uh, which side dominant is is your brain like my role increasingly is as uh, I think of it in two ways. I mean, I think increasingly I'm less a uh, old school editor in the way that I would I still do that work. Um uh, and um I have relationships with certain writers and I edit them. But that work is increasingly done by my team. Uh there you know someone like a Twinkle Khan now or Jyoti Dibaker some of our biggest writers their relationships are with me and I still edit them love working with them but I take on less and less. Uh and my editors do most so i have really two or three big functions one is i'm the i'm the energy giver and the idea generator right i'm the one who says guys i think we need a book on this now who's going to do it right or i feel like this is in the air and we've got to do this or you know like uh, let me give you an example of the current job that i did in come from me it came from one of my editors parts who said you know he's been posting a lot of things on instagram should be asked should we do kids editions of his films hmm and that was his idea like you know could we take kabhi khushi kuch kabhi gham and then write it for children and then i couldn't see that but i said i said well listen why don't we just ask him to write a children's book and i was like yeah because it just so but it was really a follow through from that idea which is uh, happened not to be my idea's parts idea and then once we all said yes then i was like okay i'll reach out to him 
uh, I knew someone who knew him. So I sent a message uh, and then this person said, look, I think he's actually quite interested. So I'll connect you. And then when I connected with him, that was it. It happened very easily. So, um, but I am on the whole, the, I probably am the biggest ideas generator in the office. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will say, I think we need books on this. I think, for example, one of the things that we started doing in Jagannath is we started doing a lot of history. I felt that... Um, Indians love history. What's that? I said Indians love history. If you look at the podcast yeah. charts in India, the number one, uh, the number one to five usually happen to have history podcasts in them. Oh, wow, that's so interesting. I mean, I, I that would bear it out from what I, you know, I think. So, you know, this, so I might say, listen, you know what, we've done most of the Mughals, tick, tick, tick. Now, have we looked enough at South Indian history? Yeah. And, you know, what have we covered? What have we not? Where are those books? And I, and I, I'm often that, uh, I'm that person who says, okay, listen, we've been talking about this one. I'll, I'll give you an example, right? So uh, there's a book idea that we had. Again, my team are incredibly smart. So I think it's an idea that, that people, everyone collectively thought we wanted to do a very racy history of India's freedom fighting, right? 1857 to 1947. We wanted, our pitch was to ourselves that this should be like a thriller. Like it should be like, because there's so like just seeing Bhagat Singh, bombs, jail, terrorists, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, they, I, they, they were so action packed, right? And yeah. also what's interesting is that, you know, there were two things happening. There was a clear villain in the story. It was not, an, in the, you know, we, we needed those guys out, right? We needed the Brits out of our country and everyone fought it. And there were these amazing characters. I mean, how many films could have characters with the uh, with the depth and color and personality of a Jinnah, a Nehru, a Gandhi, a Patel, an Ambedkar? I mean, just think about it creatively, right? You could do so much with them. So we've been playing with this idea and we said, uh, you know, who will, and we've been playing with this idea for like five months. We can, and so what is my job? Every two months, every two weeks or three weeks, I raise the idea again. And I say, guys, we haven't found the writer for this. What do we do, right? And, uh, and we found him. We found our writer. We signed this book on. It's going to happen. And that, so I am this, call it the drum beater, the idea person, the person who was thump, thump, thump. But the person who sort of comes into the room and makes people, you know, the big thing I'm, I believe in is don't talk, deliver. Right, like just like yeah. so, we can talk forever about this brilliant idea that we all had and pat ourselves on the back. We're so clever. We no man, this book has to be done. Who, what does that yeah. mean? The contract has to be done, the manuscript has to be written, and the book has to be bloody published. The book has to sell truckloads, and then I can pat myself on the back. Right the, at the idea stage, we are only like it's just like a, like heart. It's just an embryo. Okay, it's nothing. So I think that's my big role uh, on the editorial side. Um, and uh, the other key as thing that I get very involved in is I've been obsessed about publicity all my life. It's a very big, huge interest area of mine. Um, I would have loved to, in my other career, I would have been a marketeer, I think. Uh, I wouldn't have told you that but in my, if you met me at college and you said to me, you, could, you know, would you like to be a marketer? I'd say, what, what, what? No, I'm a bookish girl and I'm a nerd and what is all this marketeer business? Actually, it's one of the things I've discovered about myself as I've worked, that it's something I like, it's something I'm good at, it's something I like thinking about, uh, which is really thinking about why people might be interested in something. That's what marketing is, and how to make them interested, right? It's about people and their motivations and their responses, and that is what marketing ultimately is. And so to me, I'm, it's an it's a area that I'm really, really interested in, and so I am very, very involved in the marketing and publicity of our book. Incredibly. Uh, in fact, I would say that editors on the whole tend not to be, because if you worked in a big company, there's a natural, there's a head of publicity who manages that, right? And because Jagannath is small and we're a startup and everyone does everything, uh, I can have this role where I do both of these things. Uh, if I worked in a bigger company, I wouldn't uh, be able to do it. And it's been one of the great satisfactions of Jagannath because it's something I've loved doing and I've got more into it over these last three years than I've ever been. And, and so I am also the big, um, 
I, I so I have certain beliefs about how marketing has to be done. Publicity, for example, I I think that you have to conceptualize any book campaign on a week by week basis, and the publicity person has to present it as week one, week two, week three, week four. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think that we have to have committed dates as much as possible on as much of our campaigns so that we can then sync it in with sales. Um, I uh, so there's a kind of call it a discipline that I believe in that I, I sort of enforce on the team. And then alongside that, I ask, I'm often, I'm the bitch. I'm, I'm the bitch in the publicity. I mean, I, as in I, I'm the person who says, no, not good enough. Come back yeah. better. This isn't strong. You haven't worked this out. I, I do a lot of that in publicity in a way that I don't do with editorial. And, um, but it does make, I think the team probably finds it exhausting to work with me, but they do come back with very, very strong campaigns. We, we have now made a reputation for ourselves about our publicity campaigns in-house. And it's because of, I'm not sure that my style and my leadership style is the right style, but it has been an effective style uh, for our company. And we are a small company with outside hits and outside PR because of the way because of my interest in the way we run it. And then I will often be the person who, though I'm not the only person, again, uh, I got editors involved in publicity because I believe they understand the book better than the publicity person because they've read it. Um, so that's a big change in the way we manage publicity, unlike other publicity departments. And uh, I've made all our editors think about books in a publicity oriented way. So when we buy a book, we think of the publicity alongside buying the book. We never just say we buy a book because it's good. We, we say, why should we buy this book? How can we talk about it? And one of the things I'm really mean to about my editors is if they can't talk about it properly in the editorial team, I'm like, Sorry, because because remember what happens with any book, right? I mean, here we're talking about the print business rather than digital business. Digital yeah. is completely different. We can talk about that in another way. But I have a, you've written a thriller. It's a yeah. first coronavirus thriller, right? You've done it. It's India, coronavirus. There's a uh, evil health minister. There's a corrupt businessman, whatever it is, right? You've written this book. And I, I have to describe it to the team. And now if I say... Uh, it's a thriller. It's very well written, very gripping, good characters. You know what I'll say? Fuck you. I mean, how many times? I mean, are you describing a particular book or like 30 other books? Just think, and yeah. this is why, why is this important? Because see, every editor loves their book like their own child, but that love as you go through the chain of publishing decreases. So I love my child. Then it goes to the publicist who loves it less than I do. Then it goes to a, a newspaper uh, person, right, who runs the book's pages, who loves it less than the publicist does. Then yeah. it goes to, uh, alongside it goes towards our salesperson, who does not read mostly, right? The sales teams in India are not readers. So they don't, they like, they just hear whatever we say and they pass it out, right? Then it goes to the retailer. Our average bookshop guys are not like super literate. They're not like reading Shakespeare and stuff and running Shakespeare and Company in Paris, right? They're like some guy and they it's a business for them and they struggle and they read a little bit, but they may not read a little bit. So they love, they barely love it. And every day, everyone is telling them in every parishing us, ye kitab sabse hai. right? He's here. I mean, it's like, like the, you know, like uh, the, what's it called? The cry wolf thing, right? How yeah. often does that poor bookseller have to hear that this is an amazing book? Um, every day he hears it at least 500 times. Okay. And he works, Imagine a bookseller who's worked in the business for 10 years. That's all he bloody years. He doesn't believe you. He's heard it too often. So if you can't, as an editor, talk about, oops, my chair's just broken. Uh -huh. um, oh, damn. If you kind of enthusiasm, it's okay. Can you, can you sit down? As an editor, I'm fine, actually. Okay. It's okay. I can sit in this broken chair for a bit. If you can't, uh, if you can't buy, if you can't talk about a book in a specific way, so I say, look, it's, it's coronavirus in India. It's got real life characters, thinly veiled. It's X meets Y, blah, blah, blah. And if I don't talk about it in a very specific, compelling way, then that communication just loses itself all the way down to the chain where you as a reader walk into a store and the bookseller has to say that this is a good book. 
or where you have to be sort of communication and marketing orientated is is very much a juggernaut thing. It's a it's a juggernaut DNA and that comes with the fact that publicity and editorial everyone work really closely together. So so those are my two really big roles and then my third big role is really app stuff. What do the mailers look like? Our in-app notifications. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's on our banners? Um, how do we choose uh, ideas for? We often commission stuff just for the app that we don't, which we do fast, or and we try and do interesting distribution deals. A lot of those ideas may come from me. I made a deal with, say, Harvard Business School to put out a lot of their material on our app. Um, we reached out to this amazing YouTube blogger called Dhruvrati. I saw that. His, uh, and he's on our app. So some of those big drive ideas may come from me. And I'll say, let's go get this. Let's go get this. Uh, you know, I may be the one who reaches out to Sadhguru's office to say that, listen, can we have your spiritual talks on our app? So there is a certain time commissioning that happens on the app. I am one of many people who do it in the office. Uh, but, but I may be the person who pulls in slightly the more or has the slightly bigger, more high profile ideas. And then on the banners, I'll say, you know, we've done two business. I mean, I do a bunch of stuff on the app side, which I think any relatively senior product driven person on, on a digital business would do. Um, so, you know, we it's a communication samey. Uh, what's happening on our in-app notifications, when does it work, when does, you know, we find when we have in-apps which are about a particular title, it never works. Um, yeah. So, you know, what are the things that are getting click-throughs, uh, thinking about different carousels, uh, et cetera, um, thinking through payment plans. Uh, I'm. Uh, we just had a really big light bulb moment about how people read online in India and one of our big uh, uh, sort of uh, lessons is I don't think Indians like unlimited reading plans in India because they don't feel they read enough and they you know with a Netflix or a Spotify uh, you get an unlimited because you binge but books are not binging no one unless you're a really high even I don't binge on books and I'm a yeah. coach. It's weird, I right? Mean, you, 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 need, you need some sort of like cognitive resting time to figure out and just let the book sink in, right? And it takes time. I mean, yeah. books take time. Books are on one hand, we're a media, we're a digital media company, but we, in many ways, we're just, reading is less easy than audio and even, you know, and then video. I mean, it's video is the easiest, audio is second. Yeah. Uh, and and then books. So so you know that was a big insight that my CEO and I came to in this moment of lockdown because we've been doing, we've had a very high gro- huge growth on the app and we've been doing surveys for all the new users and uh, we you know I mean there are people who say I read two books a year a month which is a very high number and they still feel guilty. So even today a, a super reader doesn't feel like they read enough. So if the super reader doesn't feel like they read enough, what happens to an average reader, right? And, and you're yeah. telling that person to pick an unlimited plan. They'll say, but I will, I don't have this binging unlimited thing. I, you know, I only read. So, so we've actually conceptualized. I'm very excited by this breakthrough because, you know, until a month and a half ago, we were plugging and pushing an unlimited reading plan. We thought this is the way. This is how Spot, Spot, uh, Spotify works and Netflix works and Hotstar works and you know, we're an app media company. So that's how we have to work it. And actually we've now made this real shift. And the app, I think the digital side of the business in constantly making me think about my readers and my users and what they're clicking and what they respond to has made me, my biggest learnings have come from there. So, you know, while in a way I have a lot of energy that I put in what I would call a traditional business, you know, ideas, publicity, These are things that are normal print. Uh, the, I think Jagana really is more user driven than most publishers because we have this app. Every day we're dealing with what a person responds to. What are they clicking? You know, we even did, I'll give you an example. Uh, we did this really cool thing 
two weeks ago, we did a, a readathon of Kabuliwala where we got nine. I saw that. That was a brilliant campaign. You got eighteen influencers from different categories to come and read that on Twitter, and I saw yeah, that it was trending. And we also got, you know, we did call-ins for readings, and then we stitched it up between VIP celebs and then just people who had done really good re- readings, and then put it together. Now, one of the really interesting things was. Do you know why we picked Kabuliwala? It was a story that had done very well on our app. And so I knew that it was on my mind because it's a small, it's an old classic story. It isn't exactly like a story that I think about on a daily basis, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and it was actually a story that I, I realized that, you know, there's a real emotional connect with that story because whenever we put that story on our banner or whenever it's on a carousel, it, it just performs very well. And so this understanding of what is performing, when is it performing, making you really, why is it that people click on, don't like clicking on title, uh, a title in app notifications. Um, you know, uh, we do these things called summaries where we do 15 minute uh, summaries of bestsellers. Super we, effective for the Indian population. Everyone who loves self-help and like just knowing enough to talk about at a party, he loves those things. I hope so. I mean, it's a very popular thing on the thing. And we it's, it actually requires a lot of work because we get our editors to read it and then they have to summarize it in their own words and then pick insights from it and pick quotes from it so that it's like a, you know, you get a really a, a nice little encapsulation of it. And, um, you know, the, because it does so well, one of our just our learnings last week was Let's always put it, let's, you know, we do an insight on our homepage banner every week, but let's always put it in the last because it just does well anyway. So let's give the number one banner homepage, not to the, the one that always does well. We can take that for granted, but maybe something unusual that we want to give space to. So some of those kinds of conversations about how do we communicate, what do we press to make people get into things more, um, what are the ways, you know, all of that, what's the lingo that we are using, what is the placement, uh, you know, one of the things we began to talk about is that do people tend to click on covers with figures more than abstract figures? What did you discover? Uh, so, we, it, you know what, we have to push this because we kind of came, it was a, I think it was a falsely done experiment because what we did was we took this one cover and changed the cover just for digital. Hmm. And just to see whether putting, oh, so here's the thing. We said that if you put a girl on the cover, it would get more clicks. That was our yeah. insight. Yeah, that, that's actually, that's actually ha- has some scientific evidence too, because um, all the cosmopolitan magazines that were you know, published in the early 90s and 2000s actually show that you have a woman. If you have a woman in red and uh, who's either white or blonde, again, this is slightly jargon, slightly conjecture, slightly based on research studies, that more men are likely to buy it. Something like that. Well, there you go. And and uh, the only I, why I say it was a failed experiment is that we did put a woman on the cover, but I'm not sure that that cover was especially good. And this is the problem, right? Then you, you how do you quantify it? Is it is the less click through because there's a woman on it, or is just not an interesting, attractive enough cover? But every once in a while, we have those kinds of conversations. So the app makes me. The app has made me better at my job. Yeah. Because it forced me to ask questions that I about our books and our material and how we present it in a way. And every day, because I'm seeing audience response to it, it's the it's very it's completely driven through. Uh, you know, it's not like a hypothesis. It's not like oh, I feel like it or I believe it. Yeah. It's not like that. And that thinking, I think, you know, publishing on the whole doesn't help. And publishing on the whole is wary of and even dismissive of uh, and threatened by. And I think, again, the Jagannath model, I mean, you know, I think about it in various ways, in ways it's changed my life, but it's made me better at my job as a publisher, even as a classic book publisher, as a print publisher, because I've had to deal with readers and users at a everyday level with a directness that I just... And I'll give you another example, right? We find that Jagannath figures there are more readers in the South than in the North. And we know yeah. that the South Isn't that is on the literacy board. rates. Yeah. They're higher up. It's literacy rates. It's also education. I think there's a certain kind of the professional middle class world 
educated uh-huh. world. I think there's a higher number in South India than there is in North India. Now, let me tell you how this will change our lives. One of the things we think about a lot in our editorial team is should we actually ensure that a large amount of our list is South, South, South India subjects? Why do Sorry, we only do... I lost the audio for a sec. Yeah. A large number of our commissioning, our ideas are from South India. Interesting. If that's where my readers are, for example, a biography of Karuna Niti. For example, the history of the Chalukyas, right? Now, I think when I sat in Random House or in Penguin, we just said Chalukyas, huh? What is that? That's dynasty in the South. That's a bit vague. Shall we do a sultanate with uh, <laughs> you know, or, uh, Akbar? Yeah. And because it's very, it's very arrogant, right? I mean, I'm not a South Indian and I, but it is interesting that actually, sorry, I mean, you know, I mean, that world is, and so we have an author called Manu Pilla, who's a very brilliant young uh, historian from Kerala who writes, who's been writing a bunch of amazing books on, in, especially on South Indian history. So he did one on Kerala, he did one on Deccan. And of course, he's incredibly charismatic and brilliant, but I also think one of the reasons he's as successful as he is, he's created a niche for himself. There's a South Indian reader who wants, and South Indian William Dalrymple, he wants a popular historian who writes about <laughs> his work. And Manupila is that. And he's also an excellent communicator. He speaks very well. He's an attractive boy. I mean, the package is all good, so it all works. Yeah. But... Uh, so, you know, but, but I don't think I would have ever been able to, in any other company, tell my editorial team, let us put a focus on South India without having had this app constantly showing me data that actually my readers are in the South. Um, so, you know, this is where the two worlds meet and talk to each other. Because on one hand, this first bit that I described to you, the creative process, is what allows me to make books that people can read whether as a print book or as a digital book or as anything, right? Or as an audio book. Story, the conceptualizing and the getting it out. But then this other world, the world of the app and my being a platform owner allows me a rigor in my decision-making process, Uh in the way I communicate, uh, in what I commission, uh, in how I project this book uh, from design to how I talk about it. And, and because it is constantly talking to the user. And this, I think, is why I would say to virtually any publisher, whoever's watching this, this is what is most compelling about having your own platform. It's a business, but it's a business that, you know, there's a visible, tangible gain of subscription money and being able to sell directly to your users. But there's an extraordinary intangible gain of you understanding your readers and learning about your readers in a way that will feed into every part of your business. Um, and Jagannath is still in a very small company. We have many, many more years of growth to go, but it's this, it's, it's this world meeting, combining, meshing that's created our magic. Wow, Chiki, I have to say I'm a fan. That was, that was absolutely impressive. I have to, like, I, I think what you were saying uh, is, is very essential to, uh, to the idea that there's no point in being emotional about what you want to do you eventually have to meet what the market wants, right? And being data-driven in, 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 a, in a world, and I'm only an outsider to the publishing world, right? I assume people sitting in their ivory towers wearing, again, they're all blacks and saying, I will think this idea will work, right? And then putting it out and failing. And, um, and it's very important to, to give people what they want. In fact, um, I actually learned about you from Tony Joseph's Early Indians, which I have right here. Right. Yeah. I saw Juggernaut books, and I was By like, "By the way, we commissioned. I, I used to follow him on Twitter. I I saw him tweet about this stuff. Yeah. And I direct messaged him on tweet and uh, Twitter, and I said, "Listen, write us this book." And that's how this book happened. Fantastic. See, this this is this is the power of the internet of having your own platform. I mean, I'll just you know reiterate what you said back to you. Um, I have this podcast. It's right here on YouTube. I can get cool people who I'm interested in to have a conversation with me. Right. And and uh, all of this happened because of this book. This is the internet 2.0. This is exactly what's happening. And we're in the center of it. I think people are not adopting at this point and ad- adapting to this world uh, are, are massively missing out. Um, and, and I'm extremely inspired by all the things that you've said today. Uh, this, is, this is one of my podcasts where I've been extremely quiet, just getting all the notes, take, picking, paying all the attention. 
I've been listening to this one a bunch. Uh, it's been a blast having you on here. Um, and uh, where where can people follow you? Thank where you. can they find you? Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Insta. At um, Chiki Sarkar, right? I think it's at Chiki Sarkar or Chiki dot Sarkar. It's one of the. Yeah. Two. What does your name mean? Uh, it's you know I'm Bengali, so Bengalis get given these nonsense nicknames. <laughs> Like Puklu, Tuklu, Puklu, you know, like that. So I have this name, Chiki means nothing. But I have this long Sanskrit real name, which I'm not going to talk to you about. Hate it. Very few people know it. It's the name on my passport. It's the name on my birth certificate. Uh, I haven't changed it. So I have a, I, I go by my nickname everywhere, socially, professionally, everywhere. I, in fact, I had told my three-year-old son, I said, you know, I have another name. And he's very bemused. He suddenly looked at me like, what? Is this like an other identity? Is there, is, does mom have a secret identity? Like, I said, yeah, you know, I have, Chiki's not my real name. I have another name. He's very intrigued. He's been looking at me yeah. funny all day. Since I said it's, it's a fascinating um, name. But listen, I've got to go too. So thank you so much. This is fun uh, and a pleasure. And um, it was great to be able to speak about all the things I do. So thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this will be out on Monday at 7 p.m. IST. People can follow you at Chiki Sarkar. It was a blast. Uh, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.